Dr. Burke, welcome back. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks again for having me. Um, so Dr. Burke, Judas is a figure that seems to get a lot of press, for lack of a better term, in apocryphal literature. Um, one of the earliest, uh, that of Papias in his Exposition 4, discusses the death of Judas. Uh, it's just completely wild. Like he swells up like a garbage pill kid, essentially, in verse in one of the recensions. So I don't know if you could just discuss those two recensions. And um, are these the earliest examples besides the ones we have in Acts and Matthew regarding the death of Judas? I'll back up just a little bit. Like um, the, the version that, that you that you read is in, included in uh, one of my books, the New Testament, more canonical monocanonical scriptures, uh, volume one. And, and the reason, uh, like this, the whole goal of this series is to, is to present texts that, that people are not not as aware of. You know, most, a lot of people know the Gospel of Thomas and um, Gospel of Mary and so on. Um, but here was this story about the death of Judas that most people aren't aware of. And I re really wanted to include it in there. And uh, you mentioned that Acts and Matthew have, have their own versions of the death of Judas. So already in the New Testament, we have, two separate versions, right, of the story. And um, to have a third is, is, is quite interesting, I think. And, and it's a quite early one. Papias was writing around the middle, uh, middle of the second century, early se second century, maybe. Um, we, don't, we don't have the full text that, of Papias's work, Exposition on, on the Sayings of the Lord, but we have quotations uh, from it. And one of the things that, that, that Papias says is, is how much he values uh, orally transmitted story. So he, he knows people who knew the apostles. So he, he prefers those kinds of traditions over written traditions. So there's a bit of a romanticism about Papias that, that he knows things that, that uh, nobody else was aware of. And, and the more material we can uh, kind of pluck from our sources by Papias, the better. So here we have this story and, and it's only, uh, um, it's a, again, it's a quoted piece um, it's, it's found in a uh, commentary on scriptures. Um, so someone quotes it in connection with, with the new Testament stories. And yeah, it's a really interesting little story. It's a, it's a horrible story, as you said, and, uh, Judas kind of swells up and, and, uh, various body parts swell up as well and kind of explode. Um, that it's necess it's, uh, more, uh, original or truthful than the one we find in the new Testament. I don't know if any of them are really truthful necessarily they're 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 almost um caricatures right if, if each story is a is a um you know the one thing that we know of uh, at the earliest about judas is paul mentions that jesus on the night uh was betrayed or handed over that's all paul knew and then when we get to the gospels we get this this, this story kind of fleshed out we don't know if the, that fleshing out by matthew and and uh, the book of acts uh are have any historical value at all um, so I don't know, I'm not saying a Papias is, is, is any better necessarily than those, but it certainly is interesting. And, and it, it follows a certain, um, um, convention of, of, uh, that we see in other writings of the time where, um, a, a person who's particularly vile, their, their, their evil nature eats away at them from inside. We usually see, okay. So the this, this story follows a, a convention that we see, uh, usually associated with tyrants. So bad Kings like Herod or King Agrippa or others, where um, they meet their end, um, usually by being kind of eaten away from the inside by worms or something like that. And the story of Judas is similar. It just shows you how a character who is so evil on the outside um, and done, has done some terrible things, they meet their uh, justified end and it's from rotting from within. And that's what we see in the Judas, uh, Papias' version of the Judas story. So very early on you have, conflicting accounts of how Judas passed. Um, and it kind of culminates in these stories, right? And Papias and then Matthew and, and, and Luke. And like you say, Paul is the earliest um, account of Jesus being betrayed. Um, but then we get century a little bit later, like centuries down the line, and we have something uh, which I found fascinating, uh, this text in your um uh, in your volume, uh, more New Testament Apocrypha, uh, it, it called the Legend of the Thirty Pieces of Silver. It's a really mm -hmm. trippy story. Um, 
the coins are very interesting in this story. They almost function as like a monkey's paw or the lament configuration if you've ever seen the Hellraiser movies. Like it's just like this cursed object that changes hands through time and space and nothing good can come of it. It's kind of like in the the heavy metal movie if you've seen that like the orb it goes <laughs> it goes everywhere. And, it's a good and, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh so I was wondering what your further thoughts on uh the legend of the 30 pieces of silver. I came across this text, like I started an interest in it when I saw a reference to it in a, a manuscript catalog. So uh, I was working on a particular manuscript and this, this particular text was listed in there too. And I hadn't seen it before. And um, I, have a, I have a blog, it's called Apocryphicity. And early on in the, in the creation of this blog, so years ago, I had mentioned to it, uh, I mentioned the text and asked, you know, does anyone know anything about this text? And then uh, a, a guy in... Uh, um, uh, Slovakia, uh, named Slavmir Chiplo, he said, I know a little bit about that. And so the two of us started this working relationship on the text, and we put together um, uh, a critical edition of the Syriac tradition, which had never been really worked on before. Um, so I'm quite connected with this text. And it's it's not very long. It's, it, it's uh, relatively short. And it does tell this story of, of where these silver pieces came from and how they inter intersect with various moments in biblical history. So it's a bit of like a Forrest Gump of these, uh, these, these silver pieces. So wherever there's some reference to money in the biblical story, if it's uh, um, Joseph being purchased um, um, by, I think it's Midianites, um, his, his brothers sell him. And so they get money. So that, that money, that was the 30 silver pieces. Or Nebuchadnezzar uh, is, is purchasing, is uh, plundering the temple. He, well, he plunders those 30 silver pieces from there as well. So they intersect in various ways until they finally come to, to Judas. Uh, well, they come to the, the, the Jewish authorities first, and then they pay Judas um, for uh, betraying Judas, Jesus with these 30 pieces. So, yeah, it really does intersect in various places in history. Um, one of the, the most interesting aspects of it to me is its connection to, to actual uh, coins that were uh, collected by people in uh, medieval times uh, people you know like today they, they like to be connected uh, with history in a very tactile way and so they they they, they will purchase uh, um, uh, relics of some kind and and these were um, actually gold coins so they, they had to be kind of a special explanation for how the silver coins became gold but you right. could purchase these 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 Judas pennies and the text then will function as a kind of a, a certificate of authority, of authenticity, I should say, for these coins. Because you can say, well, check out my coins and let me tell you the story. Because they, they came originally from Terah, who gave them to Abraham, who gave them to so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, to Jews, and now I have them. And so you become part of that story, right? Um, so I think that that, that that interplay between text and, and coins is really interesting. Um, really an interesting aspect of the 30 pieces of silver, but also um, a lot of apocryphal texts, if I'm not mistaken, had this kind of function in a way, like you had pieces of the true cross and how the true cross got the, sure. this place or that place, things like that. So it's very um, interesting, these uh, origin stories of these uh, important relics uh, in the lore uh, of the people around every, around it. So they come full circle. Uh, and this was another really interesting text, the medieval uh, life of Judas. So I found this really, really uh, mind blowing because Judas is almost portrayed like a tragic Greek antihero yeah. in some ways at certain aspects. So I was wondering if you could further elaborate on what that text is and your thoughts on it. Very popular text. It, it's there's lots and lots of copies in lots and lots of languages, but it's not often. Uh, placed in collections of apocryphal texts because it, it's relatively late. It's it's uh, maybe 9th century, 10th century, something like that. Um, most apocrypha collections tend to focus on the first three centuries. That's why the more New Testament apocrypha series that, that I'm working with uh, is trying to redress that by saying, you know, let's look at some texts from, from other time periods. So we, we included this in, I think, the second volume of this series. It tells the story of, of, of the birth of Judas. He's born to... Um, 
uh, I think it's a wealthy man, and um, the man receives a vision that that this child will be the death of him in some way. So he abandons the child, but at first he marks up his ankle so he he'll know to recognize him later on. So there's a there's kind of a, an injury to the ankle, and then um, he gets uh, 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 picked up by someone later on. He grows up into the court of King Herod. Uh, he ends up uh, accidentally, unbeknownst to him, killing his father and then marrying his mother. So it's a famous Oedipus story it's from, as you say, Greek tragedy. And then it's discovered what happened. And as a result though, you know, uh, you know, it, the, the story is not, you know, Judas is evil because he did these things. It's, he's a tragic character, like you said, and, and you feel a bit of sympathy for him to some extent. And um, in various apocryphal texts, we, we, we see these kinds of efforts to, not not redeem Judas so much as try to understand him or try to find some sympathy for him, um, right? And and this is one of those examples. And there's a there's a, another text called the Acts of uh, Andrew and Paul. And at one point in this, Paul talks about going down to hell, um, just like Jesus did. And he meets Judas, and Judas is all alone. He's the last one there because, of course, he's not redeemed. Everyone else gets to go to heaven, but Judas stays in hell. Um, but you do feel a bit of sympathy for the character because we hear his, of his efforts to try and get um, forgiveness from Jesus. And one of the ways he did it was, um, well, at one point in the text, Jesus is like, well, I need to talk to Jesus. I need to get forgiveness. But he's on trial right now. So what am I going to do? I know I'll kill myself and then I'll meet him in the underworld and then I'll ask him for forgiveness. So he's, he's kind of this resourceful character in a way and a bit, again, a bit sympathetic. He's eager for the forgiveness but of course jesus doesn't forgive him and so he remains right. in hell forever um you know something like nico uh kazanzakis uh, kazanzakis yeah sorry the similar names <laughs> you know uh with the last temptation of christ you know whether it be the book or the movie you know you have people still striving to kind of understand who he was not necessarily always sympathize with him and try to rehabilitate his character but to give him some depth you know, maybe he's, there are some ways where we're uncomfortable, but he is in a way relatable <laughs> to, you know, some of our feelings. So, uh, and you see that even in uh, things like Dante, you know, Dante's treatment of Judas and the uh, Divine Comedy trilogy, you know, people are just trying to understand this character. And uh, I think this kind of goes to um, my next question about a text that isn't necessarily apocryphal, but it is a non-canonical text, um, Gospel of Judas. Um, is it fair to say that this is yet another, like more lore, in other, in other words, circulating among communities about Judas? Um, you know, I'm not sure we can say how widespread that lore was compared to mm -hmm. something like Life of Judas or, you know, Papias' uh, discussion of him. But uh, I was just wondering, uh, what do you think about Judas as portrayed there versus what you, we see in these apocryphal texts? Think about this Gospel of Judas uh, in history because it's mentioned by a church writer named Eusebius, uh, you know, not Eusebius, um, Irenaeus, around 180. So it's a, it makes it fairly early, um, mid second century. And he talks about it as connected to a particular uh, group called the Cainites uh, and, quote, and, you know, describes it a little bit. So we know this text existed then because it matches Irenaeus's description. Uh, but we have this one copy of it and we only just found it. So yet, uh, and uh, so certainly not, it seems, widespread in antiquity. And it didn't survive antiquity except for this one copy. And it's an in Coptic, so it's not the original language. The original language would have been Greek. Um, so yeah, compared to like Life of Judas or the Silver Pieces, which have lots and lots of manuscripts in lots of different languages, this is a, our only uh, example of this one text. Um, and it, it's certainly uh, unorthodox. It's got some in ideas in there that that uh, mainstream Christianity would be quite uncomfortable with. Um, but um, as the story goes, it's 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 presented at uh, I think it's the Last Supper, so it's it's before Jesus has died, and Jesus is is. Uh, um, with the disciples, with the apostles, and Judas is there too. But it portrays the apostles in a very negative way. Um, Jesus laughs at them at one point because he says that they are worshiping the wrong God. They think they're worshiping uh, the real God, but in this, the, the system behind this text, which is a Gnostic system, there are two gods. There's a God of this world, 
who's an evil de entity, sometimes called Eyal the Ba'ath or Sackless. And then there's the true God, which is where who Jesus is affiliated with. He, he comes from that true God to come down to earth and tell people about their true origins, that they should be up there in the heavens with the real God, with the good God. The apostles are, are worshiping, sacrificing, so uh, the sense that they're, they're doing uh, 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 Jewish ritual practices, as naturally they would, um, to um, this earthly God. And Jesus says, you're all wrong. Judas, though, seems to understand that that is not uh, kosher, like this is not the, the, not the right thing. So he asks Jesus for more uh, teaching. So Jesus um, gives him a whole bunch of um, cosmological um information about how the universe was created and who the true god is and who who the uh, the, uh, the 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 earth, the lower god is and in the process says again some more nasty things about the apostles so what does this say about about communities um um it seems to be a reflection of a christian group or an expression of a christian group that's uh at odds to some extent with orthodox christianity mainstream christianity which is represented by the apostles and probably by uh, the texts that are starting to become uh, quite popular that will become the New Testament. And our our writer has decided to use Judas as a foil for these. And they say, and they have Judas be the one who knows who Jesus is, as opposed to the apostles as representatives of mainstream Christianity. Um, now, when this text was discovered, though, um, the original um, editors of it, the translators, editors of it, said, here we have this text where Judas is presented as a hero. He's the guy who knows everything right. Uh, the, the other apostles don't and jesus even praises him for for the role he has to play which is to betray him and thus make you know um uh the providential history uh take its course um but later editors said no 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 that's not what the text says at all so in a, one particular uh, part where it says uh where jesus is talking to judas and he says look at the apostles they're terrible you will surpass them uh well the original editor said clearly he's a hero the new editor said no 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 you, you read that wrong it what it really says is look at those those apostles they're terrible you will surpass them in your villainy because you are going to betray me so that we have these competing uh interpretations of the text here um so it's good to know both of them and get a sense of, of, of what we think this text is really saying and of course it, the text when it was published made a big sensation uh so you have these um very upset uh conservative television host saying are you saying this text says judas was a hero and it's like no 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 and <laughs> we don't really think that at all and even so it's a text that says that it doesn't mean that the real judas was a hero um we always right. have to be very careful that whatever we have in these texts are just the expression of the writers we don't know how they intersect with history at all um but again it's, it's a great little window into this conflict in the second century between Christian groups who have different ideas about who Jesus was and about how God uh, relates to humans. And so they, they, they fight with one another through texts um, by choosing a certain apostle to be their champion and, look, and, and having him in conflict with other apostles that they portray in as negative a light as possible. So it's, it's a lot of fun working with texts that do that kind of thing. Um the whole hubbub about um, Gospel of Judas and Judas was a hero and um, just remember recalling that and then reading Bracky's uh, commentary on Gospel of Judas now it's kind of like yeah they really fumbled but in, in a way yeah. it's very interesting because it's, it's, it's exactly what we're talking about right people are kind of seeing what they want to see and interpreting the character how they want to see it so um, very fascinating uh, now I just want to shout uh, call back to your point about um, last temptation of Christ and that that scene with Judas and so here we have uh, Jesus agonizing about what he, what his role is and he's going to have to die and he's talking to Judas and Judas has to betray him and Jesus says to him yeah you you got the hard job you know so the betrayal is a harder job than dying in a horrible way and this is part of this uh, uh, nuanced view of, of Judas that, that that that's quite modern or we think it's quite modern but again, we have these texts throughout uh, history where people are still are struggling with the Jews' character about what what to do with him, and uh, so it's not a, not as modern a pursuit as we might have thought. Um, but it people it just shows you how people really like to play with this character, and I think because they're thinking about themselves, you know, 
you know, Judas, yes, he did this horrible, horrible thing, but we all do horrible things. And, and maybe if Judas is not so horrible, maybe I'm not so horrible either. Right. And if you really, if you watch that movie, it, it's almost like Judas has to really steer the ship at many times. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. Jesus very, very much wavers many times in that movie. And Judas is the one who has to keep him going. And it, it's, it's just, just an amazing, like, I love every like iteration of every character. Like I love Harry Dean Stanton as Paul <laughs> there. And I love yeah. like Harvey Keitel as Judas. Everybody's so great in that movie. But um, um, did you have anything you wanted to plug before we go? I have two two kind of big projects that that I like to make people aware of. Um, that's one popular from more non canonical scriptures, where the uh, which is a collections of texts which we don't normally see in apocryphal collections. Um, these are texts that have never been published before or haven't been um, looked at for quite some time. So we have new manuscripts and new understandings of them. And so we have two volumes that have been out, and we have the third volume, which is out any day now, so it may be out by the time uh, people are listening to this. Um, and information about those books are on my website, which is tonyburke.ca. Um, so you can look there and you'll see you know, the, the table of contents and some uh, uh, preview material. And um, uh, if you're interested in grabbing a copy of that, that'd be great. Um, and the other major um, work that's a kind of a public outreach uh, project is um, under the auspices of a group called uh, NASCAL, the North American Society for the Study of Christian Apocryphal Literature. And um, we're a group of scholars who, of course, work in the field. And the organization has a website, just nascal.com. And one of the things on that website is something called the eClavis. And this is a, uh, a big bibliographical resource for our Christian Apocryphal texts. There's uh, 250 entries on there now, probably another 100 left to go. Um, each dedicated to a particular text, and you just click on one. Let's say the life of Judas. It'll give you a summary of the text. It'll give you uh, lists of manuscripts, links to manuscript images, um, links to uh, online uh, scholarship, and and list of non-online scholarship. A whole bunch of other resources. So uh, it's free and op it's open access, um, and uh, it's a, they're great um, introductions to 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 these texts. And uh, like I said, there's hundreds of them, so this will uh, uh, keep you very busy if you get a chance to take a look at it. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, Dr. Burke, and you have a pleasant evening. Thank you.